Good morning, everybody. Do welcome some new faces in here uh, this morning. Very glad to have uh, those visiting from other classes. You know, we've been going through um, the Gospel of Luke, and so I'm going to ask everybody to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. We've been up to earlier this year, Mike Black and I were alternating. And then Mike came to the rescue when I had a family emergency, and um, he'll be back. Uh, he's coming back, uh, Lord willing, next Sunday. So, um, And he's finished uh, the book of Proverbs, and it's going to begin a new uh, study, and we'll all look forward to that. But we're continuing now, Lord willing, on a more regular basis with uh, the Gospel of Luke. 11th chapter, we're going to read and study the first 13 verses of it, uh, using Dan's uh, summation of the three major topics in this general section of the gospel. I mentioned them last week. The, after the first, uh, the need to love, illustrated by the Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, then, uh, the need to learn, and Mary's uh, example sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him teach the word while his sister scurried about. Now we have the need to pray. And I've entitled our lesson, God and Man at Prayer, uh, because the lessons that we have here from our Lord approach prayer from the perspective of both God and man. It is significant that Jesus was constantly uh, praying. It's accurate to say that it was a glorious experience for him during which he could commune with his father, whom he called Abba, uh, the familiar uh, and intimate Aramaic term uh, for one's father. And enjoy in those times of prayer from a distance, we might say, something of the loving relationship that they had shared from eternity that he yearned in his humanity for a reunion and the full restoration of their glorious presence uh, together is indicated in a number of places in our gospel. So I wanna mention some where we learn that uh, he yearned for that glory. Uh, his understanding and embracing of his coming atoning death set forth in the 12th chapter of John uh, as the ultimate hour of glory for him. Secondly, in his high priestly prayer, uh, found in John 17, it's in which he prayed, Now, Father, uh, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And also the direction that he gave Mary Magdalene uh, on the morning of his resurrection, which we looked at last Sunday in the ministry of the word in John 20 verse 17 go to my brethren he told her and say to them I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God by virtue of his obedient sacrificial death on the cross he had secured for all those for whom he died the adoption as sons so that each could have a similar filial relationship with God as he had and themselves be encouraged to address God in prayer now as Abba, Father. Uh, Luke, more than the other synoptic writers, highlighted Jesus as a man of prayer, and we will see that in our passage today at the start, at the very beginning. Uh, look there. It happened. That's so characteristic of Luke, uh, seemingly unconnected with what came before or with what will follow. He wished to highlight the importance of prayer found in Jesus' teaching and in his example. Uh, Luke writes, it happened while Jesus was praying. He records also how Jesus encouraged prayer in his followers. Why do we find it so difficult to find the time uh, to pray? That's sort of a staple uh, it seems like of our Christian lives. It's just, 
uh, you, you wake, wake up one day, I haven't prayed uh, in, in the longest time. Why? Why do we find it uh, so uh, difficult? Uh, well, uh, it, that's a consideration to undertake at another time, but one thing is certain from these verses, we have every encouragement to pray, and when we don't, we're missing out on so many blessings God has for us. Like Jesus, we have a heavenly Father who delights to have his children come to him in prayer. So let's read the verses. Uh, they give us first a model prayer uh, for Jesus' disciples, then a strong encouragement to pray uh, based on our Heavenly Father's readiness to hear our prayers and respond to them, and then finally, a clever reminder of our Father's goodness. It happened that while Jesus was praying, in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. We're going to expand on that uh, co comment that we're uh, on that uh, part of the prayer that we're so familiar with. Uh, it's got an interesting little word in it daily. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend so the, the Lord liked to tell stories, and now, now he tells a story to, to grab their attention. I suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight, and he says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. And we ought, ought not to think that he was asking for a lot. These were small loaves. Just get, it'd be like us today. Get, give me a, some crackers and, and cheese. So give, give me, uh, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, and you see probably in the margin of your Bible that is literally shamelessness. Because of your shamelessness, he will get up. Because of his shamelessness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and he who knocks, the door will be opened to him. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So the account begins with a unremarkable setting in which Jesus had been praying. <clears throat> His disciples took notice, and one of them asked him if he would teach them a pattern of prayer peculiar to Jesus himself, as it seems they had observed or even participated in, uh, possibly, uh, in the practice of John the Baptist. That was not an uncommon thing among the different religious groups of the day. The disciple took note of Jesus' example and thus asked him to provide a model for them to emulate. Because the Lord's Prayer, as found in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount, is so familiar to us, one of the first things we notice is that this version is shorter and it's phrased uh, slightly different, but that's because, for one thing, uh, Matthew's uh, version came from a sermon Jesus had given, 
uh, while Luke's emerged out of this spontaneous request from a disciple. But also, since prayer was of such importance to the Lord, it's very likely he gave this type of instruction a number of different times, and that they have differences between them indicate he was interested in giving his followers a pattern to follow, follow rather than a, a rigid creed type uh, prayer. And Jesus introduces the prayer uh, after that manner. He says, when you pray, say this, or more likely, whenever you pray, uh, say this. This is a model of the type of content that should constitute what you say when you lift up your heart to God in prayer. We're accustomed, many of us, of following that little acronym ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, uh, supplication. Uh, that's, that's legitimate too. Uh, in fact, that has these elements uh, in it. But when you, uh, when you pray, uh, this is uh, a model of the type of content that should constitute your prayer. But the very first word of the prayer provides the focus for the entire passage. Father. <coughs> this was a fundamentally different way of addressing God. It corresponds, I mentioned this earlier, to the familiar Amer Aramaic address, Abba, which is a, a how a child would address uh, their uh, father. In the entire Old Testament, consider this, um, God is only called Father 14 times. Uh, and then it's used of the nation. He is the nation's, he was the father of Israel. I, I read somewhere, I think, that Jesus is called, calls him father over 60 times we, in, the, in the New Testament. So uh, for a people who would eventually refrain from even calling God by his most essential name, Yahweh, uh, so separate in every way did they consider him, it would have been puzzling and amazing, really, to be told to address him now in this very tender and intimate way, dear father or even daddy. Uh, the form in which many of us learned this opening line of the disciples modeled prayer in, uh, from Matthew, our father which art in heaven. Uh, underscores the point. God is in heaven. So how can we then dare call him our dear father, Papa? And yet that is not just what Jesus somehow grudgingly is allowing. It's what he encourages, uh, just as he would later tell the disciples, whom he calls brothers, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. So here in prayer, we have him authorizing the adopted children of God to use the title themselves when they address God. He grants them a participation in his sonship and invites them to enter into conversation with the Lord as an obedient child eagerly would with his earthly father. Our prayer life, yours and mine, would be transformed, don't you think, if only we could muster up uh, the reality of this in our hearts every time we approach our Heavenly Father. Uh, in the foggy consciousness of the morning, like me this morning, having studied this, having prepared this, addressing the Father to, to consider that I can call God Almighty, uh, Father, and he welcomes my approach to him. It's transforming. Uh, so, uh, or the weariness of the evening, or at that spontaneous moment uh, when we look up to him or we cry to him, he is our dear Father who loves us and delights in even our feeble conversations with him. But prayer, of course, is more than mere conversation. Among other things, it's the vehicle for our request to our Father. And so there follows in the Lord's model prayer a series of petitions, uh, five in all, 
Uh, the first two, we might say, uh, vertical in dimension and relating to God, and the next three, horizontal and relating to ourselves. Rightly then, the prayer begins with this proper theocentric uh, attitude. They're almost identical to the petitions in uh, Matthew's Lord's Prayer, except that one petition is not included here, your will be done. Uh, however, it could be argued that that petition is part and parcel of the prayer for the kingdom uh, to come. That is when God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But when you pray, Jesus instructs, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Uh, this is the first and foremost petition because it establishes as the foremost priority that God be honored and worshiped as he deserves. In Semitic usage, uh, most of you know this, it's been taught so many times, but the name, in fact, I think Dan last Sunday uh, taught this, but the name of someone stood for the person himself or herself. Uh, used of God, it points to the limitless glory that belongs to him and the splendor of his attributes and his being, the name of God, and to request that his name be hallowed is to suggest that his name, above all names, should be set apart from all others and given the unique reverence and exaltation that his excellent being commands. Uh, that's what hallowed or made, hallow, made holy means. It's to set him apart as wholly other than any other created thing. And this is the mindset with which we should enter into communion with God in prayer, that of greater importance than anything that will be communicated in our prayer is the priority of God's reputation and our desire that it be enhanced in all of our experience in, in every circumstance that comes upon us. Father, hallowed be your name. The second petition is that the Father's kingdom may come. Uh, that should not come as, as a surprise. It's been a theme of Luke because Jesus had come to announce and uh, bring in uh, the kingdom. Uh, early in his ministry in Luke 4, verse 43, you remember Jesus had resisted staying in this one city. Everybody wanted him to stay and continue teaching there. Uh, and he resisted. He resisted staying there, insisting. He had other cities he needed to visit, saying, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. It was certainly true that Jesus, since the mission his father had sent him on was to bring, in a spiritual sense, at least the kingdom into the hearts of men, but the tense of this verb here in Luke's version of the prayer points to a specific point of time that one's prayer sh should seek to hasten this time when, the, when God's kingdom comes. It's at that time uh, when Christ will establish his kingdom on this earth, allowing the occasion for his will finally to be done on the earth as it is done in heaven. How often do we truly uh, pray that prayer? Your kingdom come. Lord, let your father, let your kingdom come. Let it come. Bring it. Bring your kingdom. We worry. We do a lot of complaining about the world that we live in. And it, it deserves every bit of it. Uh, we worry about the immoral uh, culture uh, around us and the relative lack of interest in the Christian faith and in spiritual things in, in general. Uh, the Bible is more and more disparaged and if not disparaged, it's ignored. But how much in the forefront of our minds is the prayerful hope that soon God will make things right by putting an end to these ungodly practices. And 
by bringing down these wicked uh, rulers and usher in something gloriously different in which he reigns as king and every knee bows to him. How, how often do we pray, your kingdom come? That is what we are to pray and that is what we ought to be pursuing. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things uh, will be added to you. All these things that occupy us so much and crowd out of our prayers, all the most important uh, petitions of all. But these other things are still important too, which brings us to these elements, these next elements in the model prayer, the horizontal petitions, uh, those that are related to us, that to uh, men and women in uh, particular. And the first of them is found in verse three. See there, give us <clears throat> each day our daily uh, bread. And by bread, of course, uh, Jesus had in mind not just bread, not just physical uh, bread, but all the material things in life uh, that are necessary for us, uh, whether it's clothing or a job or a shelter, uh, if we need a car, a car uh, to drive, uh, that all of these are wrapped up in that word of bread. So the prayer concerns, concerns more than just, just food. The verb give us is a continuous a present, and it has the sense of keep giving. So it's a summons to continually uh, look to the Lord for the things that we need for our existence. For emphasis, uh, the actual petition, give us each day, is placed at the end of the sentence. Each day we are to pray for God's a provision for us. And the thought is reinforced uh, by the rare and an unusual word uh, translated in the New American Standard, really in every version probably in this room, by daily, epiousios, uh, something like being upon. That's the Newman uh, interpretation. This is the only occurrence of the word in the New Testament, and listen, outside of the New Testament, there's one other occurrence of the word, and it's referring to its occurrence uh, here. So its me meaning is really determined by its usage in the verse. And literally, the verse reads, our bread, the, and here's the word, our bread, the daily, give to us each day. Now, if you think about it, you can see uh, how over the years, translators have come to view the meaning, according, the meaning according to when the prayer is uttered. If in the morning, it would stand for today's bread, give us today's bread. If in the evening, it would stand for tomorrow's bread. In other words, it's for the next meal. We or to pray for it and wait expectantly for it. J.B. Phillips translated it, give us each day the bread we need. I think that's a, a good interpretation of it. It is a petition that encourages utter dependence upon the Lord every day. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be good stewards and save for a rainy day, but it does imply daily dependence and the acknowledgement that no matter how much you do have stored away, it's God alone who graciously provides it as we need it. Now surely that was uh, a lesson that very sad wealthy man in Jesus' parable in the 12th chapter would have benefited from. You remember the story. His land, the Lord says, was very productive. His land was very productive and he was forced to build more and more barns in order to store all his crops. Well, that was all well and good, except it was his attitude that proved to be the man's downfall. He said to himself, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He was living the good life uh, with no concern for the future, no 
uh, understanding that his life was precarious and that there was a higher power that had provided all this for him and the same higher power that provided it could take it away from him. You see this out in the business world all the time. You hear men talking, uh, you know, I, I got to place this money somewhere. You know, <laughs> the implication they want you to know they got a lot of money and it's t they need a place to put it, a place to invest it. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. The person who is rich toward God is the one who does not put his faith in his own possessions or depend on them, but he has the attitude of this prayer here in verse 3, Lord, keep on giving what I need day by day. Keep, Lord, by, by your loving grace, keep on giving day by day what I need. The fourth and fifth petitions are found in verse 4. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So people often stumble over this fourth uh, petition, uh, for it can be read as if the request for forgiveness is based on one's own good work of forgiving uh, others. Forgive us our sins because we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted uh, to us. But a believer's sins, uh, the Bible teaches in many, many, many places uh, a believer's sins are atoned for on the cross of Christ. And this prayer is one to be uttered by a believer, addressed to uh, one's heavenly Father. Uh, but even believers uh, sin. We know that from experience, sadly. Uh, but the Bible teaches it, for example, in Romans 7, Romans chapter 8. And sin is described as causing us to come under obligation to the one against whom we have sinned. In fact, in Matthew's version, Matthew's prayer, it is the debt that is stressed. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. So the idea is likely that the evidence that one's sins are forgiven and therefore the debt paid in full is that forgiveness marks the believer's own relationship with others. So there is a warning to all who would lay claim to having God as their father, but who refuse to forgive those who are in debt to them, that they should consider perhaps their own sins have not yet been forgiven, and they're not, in fact, members of the family of God. There's also the thought here that forgiveness is a prerequisite for our own daily fellowship with God. And sometimes I'm uncomfortable using that kind of language because we do have fellowship with God through his son, by the Holy Spirit, but our communion with him is often disrupted uh, when we have sin, active sin, in our lives. And so Jesus, uh, he made that point in another place in Matthew. If you have something against your brother, this is Matthew 5, it's the Sermon on the Mount. If you have something against your brother, you are to go and, and make, make it well with him. Uh, you are to go and uh, get things right with him and only then return and resume your worship and your communion with God. Uh, this is the attitude, the practice, and the regular behavior of the true believer, like the true believer described by the Apostle John, if you think about it, in 1 John chapter uh, 1. He's the one who confesses his sins. He doesn't deny them. He confesses them, or as here, he acknowledges his sins and then enjoys the promised forgiveness and to use John's words, the cleansing from all 
uh, unrighteousness. Connected to that is the fifth and final petition of the Lord's model prayer, lead us not into temptation. And again, we're subject to confusion. If we forget certain things, God uh, doesn't cause his children to be tempted. James makes that clear in James 1.13. Uh, God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. The word translated here as a temptation can in some context mean testing, and it's possible that it's, that's its meaning here. God does allow us on occasion to be uh, tested, always for good reasons. Uh, one day there will be a great day of testing, and some have thought this prayer concerns that day. But it's more likely that the prayer is one aimed at petitioning the Lord to deliver us from succumbing to temptation when we meet up with it. For it is our daily experience, after all, temptation is, and we ought to be diligent in praying that God will keep us from stumbling when those times arrive. In fact, he is the only one who can prevent us from succumbing to temptation. If you struggle with temptation, uh, and sometimes you uh, fail to resist it, uh, take it in prayer to your heavenly Father. And now we come to this parable Jesus proceeds to tell, which sets forth our Father's readiness to hear our prayers. I said at the beginning uh, that the Lord's teaching approaches the topic from the perspective of both God and man, and here he focuses on the Father and prayer. The Lord was a good storyteller and loved to illustrate truth with ones that his listeners could relate to. And who can't relate to being wakened up in the middle of the night by a friend? Who can't relate to that? The scene is a man asleep in his one room, call it a home, his animals likely present inside with him along with his children. And they're all in one crowded bed with each other trying to make you feel better about your home, but they're all uh, in one crowded room with each other and the, the knock comes at the door at midnight. It turns out that a friend, a neighbor probably has himself had another friend arrive at that time, perhaps traveling at night in order to avoid uh, traveling in the heat of the day and the sudden now host has nothing to feed him, and you know the Eastern custom of hospitality, uh, the scandal of not showing that hospitality to a guest. So he did the only thing he could think of. He went to his friend living nearby in order to ask for bread to feed this friend who had arrived. He shouts his request from outside uh, the door, and from inside the friend responds that no. He cannot help him. It is ridiculously inconvenient considering his family and the time of night. He says, I cannot get up and give you anything, he says. And then Jesus gives the moral of the story in verse 8. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. The meaning and purpose of the parable is captured in that one word, uh, persistence, or literally shamelessness. The man with the unexpected guest, who had no other alternative, discarded his shame and pestered his neighbor until he got up and gave him what he needed. Now, if you think about it, what is the point here? There are actually two possible lessons Jesus might have wished to convey. One, obviously, is the importance of persistence in prayer. God beckons his children to come to him relentlessly when they have good reason to seek his face and plead his mercy in their time of need. We've been through that recently, relentlessly relentlessly, we and our family and, and you, our friends, went to the Lord in prayer. 
Leon Morris wrote, if we don't want what we are asking for enough to be persistent, we do not want it very much. It is not such tepid prayer that is answered. In chapter 18, Jesus will make a similar point in another story, the widow and the unrighteous judge. Even though the judge is unrighteous, yet the persistence of the widow will win the day. But the other, perhaps more preferable interpretation is to find the meaning of the parable in the attitude of the man asleep in his home in the middle of the night. In this case, it's not a comparison Jesus was making, but a contrast to the way God answers prayers. The man in the house uh, responded only eventually and still reluctantly, even though in the end he acquiesced. But God will answer our prayers willingly and be gracious in response. And he gives him, uh, as Jesus concludes, as much as he needs. He gave him as much as he needs. That's how God always operates. He's unfailingly generous. I don't know which of those interpretations is the correct one, but this interpret the second interpretation also meshes well with what now follows in verses 9 and 10. Let's read them together. I say to you, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. This is the great encouragement to prayer that shows God's eagerness and willingness to give when spurred by the repeated and escalating prayers of his people. Now, <coughs> someone may say, why? Why, if God is eager and he is willing, does he seem to sit back while we earnestly and increasingly lift up our petitions to him, first asking, uh, then seeking, finally knocking. Why the need for such relentlessness? We've all been there, why? The answer is so that we can have a part in God's overwhelming largesse in responding to our needs. In a very real sense, God doesn't need our prayers. He doesn't need them. He discovers nothing in them that he doesn't already know. He doesn't hold a stopwatch to wait until a certain time uh, to respond or to count the minutes of prayer that we spend. So some will object that prayer must be superfluous then. John Calvin addressed that in his Institutes, a, a particularly poignant section of his Institutes. Calvin wrote that those who reason in that way do not observe to what end the Lord instructed his people to pray, for he ordained it not so much for his own sake as for ours. He wishes that our hearts may be fired by a zealous and burning desire ever to seek love and serve him, while we become accustomed in every need to flee to him as to a sacred anchor, that we be prepared to receive his benefits with true gratitude of heart and thanksgiving of benefits that our prayer reminds us come from his hand, that at the same time we embrace with greater delight those things which we acknowledge to have been obtained by prayers. On account of these things, our most merciful Father, although he never either sleeps or idles, still very often gives the impression of one who is sleeping or idling in order that he must train us otherwise idle and lazy, to seek and ask and entreat him to our great good. The ignorant prate that it is superfluous for them to petition for things that the Lord is gladly ready to bestow, while those very things which flow to us from his voluntary liberality, he would have us recognize as granted to our prayers. You see, in great mercy and kindness, 
God enjoins us to come to him persistently, relentlessly, for he is a loving father who longs to give good gifts to his children and to come to their aid and to answer their prayers. That's who he is. And he brings us, it's amazing, he brings us along with him in our prayers so that we might have the joy and the wonder of being a part of his great cosmic providential care over us all. It's what Pascal called the dignity of causality, like a three-year-old helping her mother make the bed. And that's the point of the final verses. Uh, they're self-explanatory. Our Father in heaven is good. Uh, if even we human fathers and mothers, with all of our shortcomings and failings, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit uh, to those who ask Him? You see, the Spirit is our great helper. He prays for us. He is the gift that keeps on giving. Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 8. We don't know how to pray as we should. We don't know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for what? For words. God, our Father, uh, beckons us to pray. Uh, he calls for us to draw near. I think the author of Hebrews uh, put it just perfectly, to draw near with confidence to his throne of grace so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's close. Lord, we thank you for the gift of prayer. We confess our delinquency in not praying as often as we should or how we should, but yet we are encouraged by knowing that you love for us to approach you in prayer. Thank you that you hear our prayers. Thank you that you answer them according to your perfect love, grace, mercy, and wisdom. We thank you for uh, your uh, providence in our lives, that even when our prayers don't seem to get the answer that we want or expect, yet we know that you are the invisible hand that gives us the right answer at the right time every time. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.